He is forever faithful, isn't he? Amen. Well, again, once again, uh, happy Mother's Day. Um, the only one that was hit mother just left. <laughs> but happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and, of course, uh, we want to make sure to um, let our moms know, those of us that are uh, fortunate enough to still have them, to let them know how, how grateful we are for them. Amen? I want to let them know today in some special way how, how grateful we are to God that we still have them. So we're going to continue our series in Hebrews 11. And as you uh, remember, we've been talking about how by faith these different uh, Bible uh, characters, uh, these uh, Old Testament uh, heroes of faith, how they uh, walk with God and, and how they responded to God and um, how they uh, uh, acted up on God's Word. And we kind of came up with a working definition for, for biblical faith. Whenever we see the word faith in the Bible, we just need to think that faith works. Faith works in that it's practical for our lives. It's the way we live our lives. We, we put our faith and trust in so many different things. Some people put their faith in the stock market. Other people put their faith in, in others. And so uh, when we look at this uh, passage uh, uh, found in Hebrews 11, we're seeing where God's telling us and showing us examples of the Old Testament um, believers and what, what they did because they had faith. So faith is always associated with action. We act on what God's word says, on a command of God, on God's instructions, on his promises. We either believe it and, or we don't. And if we do, we act. And if we don't believe, we don't act. We do something else. So we're going to look uh, today at verses 8 through 16. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, we're going to go ahead and read the first uh, part of it. Maybe you don't mind standing with me. So here we see, um, Just uh, I'm just going to start with uh, Hebrews 11.8 at the top there and just go from there. We're going to look at some other passages as you notice on the screen. We also have Genesis 12, uh, which helps us to understand uh, God's call to Abraham's life. So it says this in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham obeyed. Let me start over because it just tells us what he did. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Let's pray for the sermon. Amen. Father, bless our time in your word. Bless our time, Lord, as we uh, consider and acknowledge, recognize, Father, uh, what it is that you're trying to tell us this morning. And we pray, Lord, that it'll be a great blessing in our lives because this chapter, Lord, is rich. If not one of the greatest chapters of the Bible, uh, it's close. And so help us, Lord, to see as uh, the author of Hebrews kind of wrapping up and is uh, summarizing uh, uh, what, what we have read for the first 10 chapters by showing us examples of these Old Testament saints and how they lived their lives and how they walked with you and why that's what pleased you. And that's what we want to do. We want to please you also, Lord. So we thank you and we ask you for your hand on all of this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. Okay, so Abraham, by faith, obeyed. It says here, when he was called to go out to a place that he was in, uh, receive his inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. I find that all this so amazing. He started walking without knowing where he was going. I'm going to cover a little bit of that later, 
But where does this actually happen in the Old Testament? Well, it happens in Genesis 12, as you see up on the screen. I want to look at a couple verses out of Genesis 12. So, before Genesis 12, there was a father of Abraham, his name was Terah. And he lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, a major city of that time in the world, the ancient world. He was, and they were, Hebrews living in uh, Ur, this, this big city. And uh, we only know about that because of Joshua 24. So just for a second, I want to read to you what Joshua is telling the tribes of Israel as right before he dies, and they're already in the promised land. He says this, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, referring to the Euphrates River. Your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham and of Naor, they served other gods. I think that's important. Abraham's family in Ur of the Chaldeans, beyond the river Euphrates. So we can't, get, we can't be wrong in our geography, because if you go to maps in the back of your Bible, how many of you have maps in the back of your Bible? You look, uh, Euphrates River goes through what was the ancient Chaldean Empire. That's where this family comes from. And what they do there, they served other gods. This is for example, one of the more famous gods was the god of the moon. So these were, <coughs> excuse me, Th this was a family that served other gods. And then he says, then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Cana and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and then we know from Isaac comes Jacob, and from Jacob comes the 12 tribes. So just a little bit of history, and the only reason for that is to acknowledge or consider one thing. These were not godly people. A lot of times what we can think is that Abraham had always been a believer. No, he hadn't always been a believer. He was a pagan, and his family and himself served other gods. Then God intervenes. That's the part I want you to see. So when we get to Genesis 12.1, that's on the screen, you see that this is uh, recorded, and it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram. Now, interesting thing for me is, why does it say he had said? Because in chapter 11, the chapter before chapter 12, wasn't that brilliant of me, chapter 11 before chapter 12? Before chapter 12, God had already called Abraham, but they didn't go all the way to the land of promise. They stayed in a place called Haran. So you can look that up on your own. I don't want to spend way too much time. But God had already spoken to Abraham, and he had obeyed, but he and his family had got delayed in a place called Haran. That's in chapter 11. So here's the thing. Our faith, when God speaks to our hearts, when God touches our hearts, our faith is always a process, okay? What I won't want you to think is that all of a sudden Abraham is this great man of faith, and oh my goodness, what an example to try and follow. I mean, he's such, he's such a wonderful, uh, and God's even writing about him in the Bible. Well, we know anything about Abraham's life is that God had to take him by the hand and Abraham failed in his faith many times before he became a strong man of faith. Isn't that encouraging? We just don't hear God's voice one day, and then all of a sudden we're just these great believers that might happen on occasion with some people. But isn't it true that our walk of faith is a process? Isn't it true that our walk of faith is learning as we go, failing and stumbling and messing up, and God in His faithfulness continues to work with us, and lo and behold, we can look back maybe five years or maybe ten years and say, 
wow, I've grown in my faith, but only because of God's patience. Isn't anyone here who could like, acknowledge that about our walk? We know that there are a lot of times where Abraham, for instance, when there was a famine in the land, he ran to Egypt. And then he lied about who Sarah was, said it was his sister, which is half true because she was a half-sister. Same father, different mothers. So a half-truth is still not the truth, even though it's half the truth. So, <coughs> Abraham's called. Do we see that up there? Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out from your country. You guys are moving. Get out from uh, Ur of the Chaldeans, is what he's telling him. And not only that, get out from your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. His father had died in Haran. But he still took Lot. Lot would become a problem later in the story. Him, the shepherds of Lot and the shepherds of Abraham's flocks got into contention. But God told him, leave your, leave your land, leave your family. Well, Lot, he's my, he's my nephew. I want to take him with me. No, well, leave everyone. Seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? He hadn't learned how to trust God. So he took Lot. And then later, that became a problem. They were fighting over the lands. They were fighting over the waters. They were fighting over their flocks. And finally, they had to split up. So when God asks us to do something, it's better to do it early than later. Because if you leave something undone, it always grows into a bigger problem. But you see here, God had called him in our... Uh, in the book of Hebrews, as you can see, I got the both verses up there. In verse 8, he said, by faith he obeyed. And he did. And when he was called, he went to a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. So here's the way it works. First, God had said to Abraham, first God called him and gave him instructions. That's how it works. First, God touches our hearts and calls us to our hearts. He gets our attention. And now it doesn't actually say here how that happened in a vision, in a dream. It doesn't say that. I'm going to believe that he spoke to him audibly, that God literally just spoke to him. Told him to get out of his country and from his family, and then he was going to go to a land that he was going to show him. That's in Hebrews or in Genesis 12, 1. <coughs> then, so first there's the call, then there's the instructions, and then there's the promises. So if you, if you hear my voice, if you follow my instructions, if you obey, then these, here are the promises I'll give you. Okay, is that the way, we, is that the way it's ordered there? What did he tell him? If we go to the next verse following Genesis, because this is where the story comes from. I'll make you a great nation. That sounds good. I will bless you and make your name great. We're talking about him today, some 4,000 years later. By the way, Abraham is known as a father of the faith, right? And you, sh you shall be a blessing. So what are the promises that God has given him? Great nation, great name, and blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Right? And I, what will he do with those that curse him? I will curse them or those who cur or curse him who curses you. And you will, you in, uh, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed and as the Lord had spoken to him. How did Abraham leave that area? As the Lord had what? Told him. So first is the call. Then there's the instructions. Then there's the promises. And these are some pretty great promises. We're going to look at something here in a second. But I wanted to cover that. 
And then he did what? What did Abraham do? It says that he had departed as the Lord had what? Spoken to him. See, here's the deal. Abraham chose to trust God. He chose to obey God, right? And in doing so, he could walk into this promised land knowing that God was going to bless him. That's the way it works. That's the way it is. So when he had obeyed, according to uh, what we had seen in Hebrews 11, right? He moves. Because faith is action. That's the whole point of chapter 11. Faith always is accompanied by activity in what God has told us. So first the call, then the instructions, then what? The promises, and then he moves. He goes to the land of promise. He starts going down. That is biblical faith. There is no other way to describe biblical faith. So now most of us in that position, what would we do? What's a possibility that what we would do? We say, hey, Lord, I know you're calling me. Uh, I know you're telling me to leave uh, my country. But, you know, I kind of would be happy if you would, like, give me a map. Give me a map first, okay, of Mesopotamia. And or maybe um, if we were to be in the same position, how many of us would actually, and here's what I want you to think about. How many of us would actually realize that he's telling us to go somewhere and we don't know where it is? How many of us would move not knowing where we're going? See, because we live in a time and place, I'm not saying it's bad, where if we don't have it drawn out perfectly and specifically, and all the details of where we're going, we're not going. This is how, tend to, how the world, the, the world wants to have the security. Listen, hear me out. Because I'm going to say, Pastor's saying that we should do things like randomly. No, if God calls, he instructs. And then if he instructs and we obey, there are blessings. So Abraham obeyed, but it says specifically there that he didn't know where he was going. We don't know where we're going. We have to just do step one. What's step one? Listen. Right? He calls them. What's step two? What's the next step? Take the step. Go. Obey. And then what about step three? Well, that's his problem. Because he said he would bless them. He would make his name great. He would make him a great nation. So we have to do our part. And usually what happens is we never get to step three to see all of his blessings because we never did step one or step two. That's how God works. He'll never give us more than where we're willing to go when we trust him. And some of us are wondering why our lives are stagnant. Because you never took the step in faith because you had to have proof and you had to have evidence instead of just his word. And we have to decide, just like he did, he chose to trust God. And he did not know where he was going, but he went there anyway, taking it one step at a time. It's one step at a time. You're not taking a risk when you trust God. You are taking a risk if you draw up plans for your life. If you study all the possibilities and you rank them in the probability of which is the most likely to succeed in this life, all the things you could do, you can draw up as many plans as you want, blueprints if you will, there's no guarantee at all that those things will happen. But if you trust God and take this step of faith, it would always be successful. See, that's where we have to take the step. Say, so you know what? I'm going to live my life trusting the Lord. Now, many of us may and can say, and I can say of my life, and 
there are parts of my life where I went nowhere. I just went in circles because I wasn't trusting the Lord. I was going nowhere fast. That's the worst place to be. You can look back 5, 10, 15 years and you go, man, I haven't done anything. Because you're trusting in your own ways. You're not trusting the Lord. See, he wants us to take these steps of faith one at a time. And when we do, and when he directs us, then we can move to step two. But we first have to take step one. And that's to listen, obey, and then to move. And then he will fulfill his promises. <coughs> Sorry, man, I woke up this morning with a really sore throat, so excuse me for coughing. Into the, I'm trying to not cough into the mic. So if we choose to act in faith with God, he'll take us to places we never imagined. I'll grab a Kleenex now. Did he know where he was going? Did he know where he was going? Right? Let's go back. Let me go back here. Does it say right there? What does it say right, right at the bottom of verse 8? And he went out not knowing where he was going. Did he know where he was going? No. But here's what I can say with complete assurance that God will always take you to places you never imagined. One step at a time. Truly. So one of the added benefits of getting older, okay, I'm 64 now. Uh, my, good, my, my dad hit 93 yesterday. He got some good genes, I guess. I hope I have as good a genes as he does. What am I trying to say is, God will take you to places you never imagined. When I look at my life today, and it's, there's good, bad, and ugly, but the good is way better than I ever imagined. And sometimes the bad is way worse than I ever imagined, but either way. God will always take you where you never imagined when you live by faith. That's the story of Abraham. Now, I went ahead and... Um, wrote the rest of what he said to, to Abraham, that I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. How, in, how is it that in Abraham all the families of the earth are blessed? Because who's the descendant of Abraham that can bless all the earth? Jesus, Jesus, in this particular verse is speaking about from Abraham, one of his descendants is going to be a king, and he's going to be a priest, and he's also going to be a sacrifice, and that's Jesus. And through Jesus, all the nations of the earth are blessed. So doesn't that make Abraham's faith great? Because all the nations of the earth are blessed through his descendant, which is Jesus. This is the gospel being preached in the Old Testament. And because Abraham obeyed, God brought this about. Abraham never saw Jesus. Abraham had his son Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. And it was believed that uh, if we look at the chronology here uh, of, of, the, of their dates of when they died, it's believed that he did get to see some of his grandchildren. But he never saw this great nation they were just a tribe. But God, in spite of the fact that it would take hundreds if not thousands of years, God is faithful to his promise to Abraham. Now, I didn't put it up there, but I want to read the rest of it in Genesis 12. And it says, and Lot went with him. That's the end of verse 4. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So he's 75 years old when God 
when he leaves Haran to, oops, my little cough drop just fell out. He's 75 years old when he goes from Haran to the promised land. Isaac is born when he's 100. He had to wait 25 years for that promise to be fulfilled. Sometimes we have to wait for God's promises to be fulfilled. But God will be faithful. Then he tells him he took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions they had gathered and the people that had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, the oak of uh, Moriah. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he moved to the hill country. And on the east of Bethel he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. By the way, Ai, uh, I forget it, I won't say it. I was going to say that uh, artificial intelligence already existed. That's the name of this city called Ai, Ai. And there he built an altar, and he went uh, uh, there and called upon the name of the Lord, and Abraham journeyed on, still going down toward Neg Negeb, which is all in the land of Canaan. So what does this say, or what do we say? It said the Lord told him that he would give his offspring the land, the land of Canaan, which is today where Israel is. Just so a little bit of current history concerning the possession of the land. God promised it to Israel. Palestine and all these riots didn't even exist until the Roman Empire came. And when they sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD, AD the Jews had already had temples there. They had, all their forefathers have lived there. All their descendants have lived there for thousands of years. It's really funny, if you want a revision in history, you can do it and believe a lie. But God gave that land to Israel. And he's the only one that could. It's his. And there were no Palestinians there. There were Canaanites. Have nothing to do with the, Can the Palestinians, the Arabs of today. The Muslims come in way after the death of Christ. There was nothing there but grasshoppers and rattlesnakes. Right? Israel had been dispersed throughout all the earth. R Rome kicked them out and they had been dispersed. So, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the Golan Heights, all that belongs to Israel. Because God gave it to them. So I would say, what is all the ruckus about? Because Satan knows that. And guess what he's starting to do? He's starting to rattle things up. Because there's a battle that's going to take place in Israel that's going to be the battle of all battles, the, the war of all wars. This is just the beginning. Maybe it doesn't go anywhere from this point, and thank God, maybe then we have more time for people to come into the, the saving grace of the gospel. But everything's going to end in Israel. When all the nations of the earth, or a great conglomerate of nations, are going to come against Israel. And that's when Jesus appears, according to the book of Zechariah. So, a little bit for current events today. Whenever we see these things happen in Israel, we know that things are starting to shape up toward the very end. We're getting closer. Now, I'm not one of those that's going to say, oh, it's going to be 20 years or 30 years or who knows when. I don't know. But it's going to end there. The book of Ezekiel talks about a, a great war that's going to take place. So does the book of Revelation. But the argument of who it belongs to, there's no doubt for us, there's no question that this was the land that God gave to Abraham. So there he goes. He goes into the promised land. And his tribe grows. Now, they go, we know that they go into Egypt for uh, 400 years. And they're slaves in Egypt. That is Israel. Remember Joseph's story? And then out of Egypt comes 
out a nation of three million, and then that's when they finally conquer what is the promised land with Joshua. And their tribes set up their places. There's land that belongs to each of the 12 tribes. And they're there during the reign of David and Solomon. Then, of course, Israel was disobedient. And we know that they were taken into captivity later. And they left the land. And they would come back to the land. And then again, they would be kicked out of the land with the Romans. So that's just a little bit of the history, but the scriptures are clear in Genesis 12 that the Lord appeared to Abraham and he said, to your offspring I will give this land. So we can take the position, if we believe in the God of this Bible, and this man Abraham, who is the father of faith, he obeyed God and God gave him this land as an inheritance. Well, you might think, well, I don't think it's fair. Fair is not even a matter of issue in this. It's what God declared. Gave it to Abraham and his descendants. Now we're going to continue with Hebrews 11. That's just a little side note. So it goes on to say, So by faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, Heirs with him of the same promise. So his heirs, Jacob, Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, right? They have the same promise. So it means it's passed down from one generation to another generation. And for all generations, it's passed down. For he was, and it goes on to say that uh, he was looking, verse 10, toward or forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So Abraham, in spite of the fact that God gave him this promise of the promised land, his real hope was eternity. So we can gather and we can collect and we can uh, own land and all types of things in this life. But for the Christian, our heart really is not in this world. It's eternity. And there's an old hymn that says... Um, um, and it speaks to, of uh, this, this world is not my home. We're just passing through. And it's true. Don't hold on too tight to the things of this life. They're temporary. We should hold on tightly to the promise of eternal life. Where we'll be with the Lord forever. So Abraham, it says here, that he looked forward to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. That's what we should... They were simply pilgrims, as we are. He lived in tents, and he built altars. And that's what we are. We're tent dwellers. We live in this tent of human flesh that's temporary. It's not going to last forever. And we should be worshipers. So we're pilgrims in a strange land looking for eternity. And while we're here, we're worshipers. Just like Abraham was. Isn't it, isn't it what he did? What he did, lived in tents, it says, with Isaac. And he built altars. He always found a place to worship God. He was a worshiper. Then it goes to the next section real quickly. By faith, Sarah. So now comes Abraham's wife. What does she do? It says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. Remember that she was barren. She couldn't have children. And God had promised that they would have a child. And that whole discussion of, well, how can I have a child if I'm sterile? Well, because God said you would. Because God could... Give life where there's death. That's what the whole point of the resurrection is. God can raise that which is dead and give it life, including the womb of Sarah. So it says here that by faith, Sarah received power to conceive. Even when she was past the age, she was like around 90, according to Genesis 
18. Remember when the two angels came to Abraham's tent and they told him that Sarah was going to have a child and she laughed? So it's kind of one of those laughs of like, this is unbelievable because it was. It's like, ah, me? Who about this old guy? It was a, a laugh of unbelief, but don't we use the word unbelief kind of like in two ways? We use it like, I don't believe. And then we use it like, I can't believe it. Well, because it's not humanly possible. So what it does is it speaks to us about, bless you, Eric. I don't know if there's a Kleenex around there or somewhere. but One of the things that we get to enjoy when we serve God is we get to enjoy the fact that he can do the unbelievable. That there, there comes a place where we accept that for God there's nothing impossible. That's how I, I love living that way. I love understanding who God is. That for him there's nothing impossible. So we can put in acts of faith. We can respond to God's word. We can accept God's word and his promises not knowing how it's going to happen, but knowing that it will. And it doesn't always happen when we want it to happen, but whenever it's the right timing, because God also is the one who created time. He knows when it's the right time, He knows when it's the right place, and He knows when it's the right thing for our lives. It's not easy waiting on the Lord, is it? But guess what? He's able to give power. He's able to do things that are impossible. And that's one of the things that the angel said to Sarah. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. So by faith, by her faith, she was able to enjoy what God did in her body to bring about this conception of Isaac. Literally what God did is he brought life where there was death. But that is who we serve. Jesus said, I'm the truth, I'm the life, I'm the way, and I'm the life. We have a living God. He's alive. He reigns in heaven supreme. That's the whole thing about this book. So, it says, by faith, in verse 11, Sarah received power to conceive even when she was past the age don't ever say, there's just no hope for me. I'm past the age. I'm past those things. My opportunity has passed. Don't ever say that. You're waiting for God to open a door? Keep waiting. He'll open it when the time is right. You're waiting for something to happen, a healing, for instance. I know that some of you here that are praying for uh, loved ones that are sick, loved ones who may have gone to the doctor and heard bad news. Well, for God, there isn't anything impossible. That's the kind of faith that they had. When we look at Abraham, when we look at Sarah, and then look what it goes on to say in verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. It's not about us. That's the, it's not about my dead body. It's not about my sick body. It's not about my, the fact that I got fired from my job. It's not about the fact that, uh, that I'm waiting for God to open a door. It's about that I consider Him who makes the promises to us faithful. It's about God's faithfulness. That's the secret to biblical faith. Abraham, I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. Well, I want to see it first. No, I'm going to show it to you. Well, I want to see it first. No, you have to take the first step, Abraham, in obedience. No, I want to see it. No, take the first step. And you could be in that circle all your life going nowhere. 
Or you can say, okay, I trust you, Lord, I'm going to take the first step. Okay, you take the first step, and he opens another door. And then you take the third step, and he opens another door because you're trusting him. And you say, well, I don't know, my body can't produce babies anymore, would say Sarah. And God says, I don't care about your body. I'm the one who's going to give you the, the power to be able to make the impossible happen. Why? Because they considered, and Sarah considered God faithful who had promised it's not about us it's about him and so it happened she had a child verse 12 goes on to say therefore by one man and him as good as dead isn't that god that's a terrible way to speak about abraham <laughs> <clears throat> it's not about one man and, and him, Abraham, is good as dead. Gosh, that would be terrible to come to a place where you realize Eric, uh, I mean, uh, Eddie, sorry, you realize, man, I, that situation is as good as dead. And God say, awesome, now I can work. Why, why does God bring us to situations or circumstances where we're like saying, I just throw up my hands, this is impossible, because he wants you to know that it's not you doing it. He wants us to realize that there's anything we can do, and then it's him who steps in, intervenes into our lives, enters into our lives in places where we say, I don't know how this is going to happen. And then we realize that he is the only one who gets all the glory because we know it wasn't us. That's why God puts us in a corner without any way out so that he can prove to us it's him. And then you took that step and you saw that he was faithful back in 2000. And then you took another step and you saw that he was faithful back in 2005. And then you had this impossible situation or this health issue or this financial issue or whatever issue in your life of marriage that's broken, uh, children who have left and are rebellious. I don't know, whatever that situation is. You said, God, I'm going to put this in your hands. I don't know how you're going to do it. And you see that all of a sudden a kid comes home, knocks on the door and wants to reconcile or someone is healed or someone is able to live longer when they were told they had six months to live. And you start looking back at your life and you see everywhere, year after year, how God's been faithful. You have to, it's like a pearl of evidence behind you of God's presence and blessings in your life. That's how it's lived. But every one of those years required one step after another in trusting Him. That's how it works. And so, therefore, verse 12, Hebrews 11, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants. That, that just blows my mind. Him as good as dead. Well, from him who was as good as dead were born descendants, check this out, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Hmm. All these died in faith, not having, I think I've got it up here, right there, the last, next one. All these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. So, what is it in your life that you need? What is it in your life that you're hoping for and you don't see it? Well, here it says that having seen them and greeted them from afar... And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. What we're doing is we as Christians, we're trusting that God's in front of us. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. But it's, if it's part of God's will for my life, it's going to happen. And I see it. Afar off. So, verse 14 goes on to say... I don't know if I went that far. 
For these people speak thus, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country that is the heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. What God is doing right now in the long run is he's preparing for us a city. He's preparing mansions for us. This world is not our home. But while we're here, we can trust Him. He's asking us to trust Him. In the long run, and I find it pretty amazing that He would not be ashamed to be called our God. Because when we accept His Son, whom He sent to be our Redeemer, that's what connects us to Him. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, the Father loves Jesus. In the scriptures, he's called, uh, when, when he sees us, he, called, he calls us, or he sees us in the beloved. He sees us in his son, Christ. Well, how do we get in Christ? By faith. So when he sees you, he sees his son. And he loves his son as equally he loves you. Because you belong to Christ. We are not our own. Paul would tell the Corinthians, we have been bought with a price, and the price that we've been bought with is the precious blood of Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, these passages. Thank you for the hope that they bring us. Thank you for allowing us to understand, Lord, that um, our faith allows us to connect to you with which there is nothing impossible. And you're asking us like we would trust in a friend or trust our parents or the stock market or whatever. You're asking us to trust you even more so. You would never fail us. That that would be an impossibility that you would come through for us each and every time, Lord, your way. And we would always be able to acknowledge, Lord, that it was you, that you're the one who is intervening. You're the one who is in, uh, working miraculously in our lives. Thank you for, first and foremost for what you've done in our hearts and how you've given us a new heart when we accept your your son, Jesus Christ, is our Savior. Thank you for all that, most importantly. And everything else, Lord, we know that if we seek first the kingdom of heaven, all these other things shall be added to us. We're so grateful, Lord, for what you're doing. We ask you to keep us, protect us, guide us, and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen.